So the project for today is we're going to build another six digit vacuum fluorescent display digital clock. And this one here is a kit that I got out of Japan. I've been waiting for it for several months. Finally got back in stock and we're going to put this one together and see how it looks. My package has arrived from Japan. I've only been waiting for this for quite a while. So I'm kind of excited. What this is, is, well, let's open it up. I've already cracked the seal on here, so. so. It's a VFD modular clock. Vacuum fluorescent display. These units are fairly rare. Because they haven't made the VFD tubes for a number of years. This is a kit that's put out and I just happened to come across it on Tindy and I just have been waiting for it since, uh, well I guess I've been waiting about 10 months for this kit to be back in stock because it's all dependent on sourcing the actual tubes. And I might make another one from the, the same, the same uh, kit supplier has two different versions. He has this one, which is the, the six digit version. So you've got your hours, minutes, and seconds. And he's got a four digit, but 15 segment version. So here's the actual vacuum fluorescent displays. And maybe we should go over how a vacuum fluorescent display works and what makes it so much different than other display technologies. Now, unlike light emitting diodes, a vacuum fluorescent display has your standard seven segments. But each of these is an anode. So each of these segments, your A, B, C, D, E, F, and G segment is connected to a separate anode wire. So each of, the, each of these have wires going out the base. And here. So you got your, your segments. These each form the plate of a vacuum tube or the anode. And in front of these there's a screen and then there's a, a cathode which is a filament. If we were to look at a cross section, if you had your, if this was your, your anode plate with all of your anodes in it and the wiring coming down the back of the tube for the different segments, in front of this there's a screen screen mesh which is given a negative voltage so these these ones are all positive voltages to control the actual segments this is given a negative bias voltage and then there's a filament in front and the filament is either given an AC or a DC voltage now what the filament does so the filament would be in front of the tube here what the filament does is it gets hot and when it just as in a vacuum tube this is your cathode it it causes electrons electrons to be emitted from the filament and they are attracted to the positive plate now the screen that's in front of it here if we put the screen here the screen is like a mesh and it is given a, a negative bias voltage that tries to repel the electron so that they don't land on the the plates or the cath or the anodes and cause them to illuminate until the voltage is sufficient, the positive charge on the anode to cause the electrons to flow through that grid. If we were to take a, a close-up look at the tube itself, which we can do here, let me just bring the camera down low so we can actually see what I've tried to illustrate because it's a little easier to see if we actually look at the tube itself. So if we look at the inside of the tube here, if I rotate the tube around, you'll see that the wires that connect it to the outside world are on the back side of the tube here and here's the the structure you can see 
the grid in front of the, the uh, segments and then right in the very front here you'll see a very fine wire that's the that's actually the cathode that is heated up and that's what bombards the electrons into the, the vacuum. This is under a high vacuum. You can see it's got a getter on here. Now the difference between this and a pneumatron, which I built a pneumatron clock before. My goal is to have all the, the different formats of, of displays. I want to build a clock in each format. The only one I don't have right now is a Panaplex and I had one years ago. And unfortunately, I built it when I was in high school and I, I've talked about this before but my, my teacher that we referred to affectionately as Mr. Bonehead because, well, he was a bonehead. <laughs> um, he had us put uh, solder paste on the board to solder acid, solder acid paste that you would use in plumbing and it, well, it just destroyed the copper traces and that clock died an early demise. I threw it out because the board was shot. Kicking myself, I should have kept it and rewired it, but it was one of those things, you know, that didn't work and I just jumped it. But anyway, the uh, Pneumatron, the tubes look very similar to this, but they're not a fluorescent display. They actually are made up of actual incandescent filaments, so they operate at a low voltage. These operate at a higher voltage, typically, you know, 50 to 60 volts is what's required because it's a vacuum tube. And it's interesting because people have actually made these into a, a type of a triode and used them as a triode tube, believe it or not, because you got a filament, you got a screen, and you've got a plate. So you can actually use this as an amplifying tube. This is, uh, I've always, I've got a couple of uh, vacuum fluorescent display clocks that, that I've made by salvaging the display from an old clock, right, an old VCR or an old clock, but they only typically have the hours and the minutes. And I've always, I always like six digit clocks. It's, Something about watching the seconds count, right? Like my my six-digit uh, Nixie tube clock. It's nothing like watching the seconds just count on it. Just just running in the background with the seconds counting looks kind of cool. I found this kit. It's a six-digit. As I say, they've also got a four-digit, which uses the 15 segment, which which is an alphanumeric display, and it basically uses the same main board as this. It's just a different. Uh, it's just a different interface, but. In this video, we're going to construct this clock, and uh, I'll put a link to it. And uh, if anybody wants to buy one, you can get them out of it right from the supplier in Japan. Just keep in mind that you may be on a waiting list because these uh, are pretty scarce. He doesn't sell a lot of them because, again, just getting these tubes are is 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 a, is a problem because they they haven't made these. And these, as you can see, these are I think these are Russian tubes in here. Yeah, these are Russian uh, VFT tubes. So. They are getting to be relatively rare these days, and of course, the, the more scarce they get, the more people want them, right? So, anyway, I'm going to put those aside for safekeeping. Let's get on with the build. And for you guys interested in where it came from, well, that's where I got it from. And they sell this on Tindy.com. So if you look them up, that's the modular clock. And say there's two versions, there's a six-digit and there's a four-digit available. Now I know I'm going to hear from people that are going to give me their opinion as to which component should be mounted first because every time I do a build somebody's got to chime off and give me their opinion. Oh you mounted the wrong components first. Uh, I mounted the components according to the instruction manual because there are procedures to test the board at various points of construction. So I'm going to mount the parts according to the construction manual. That way the board can be tested. Next is the LEDs that go in. they got two different LEDs here. And uh, the positive is going to go to the square hole and the the negative or the cathode going to the round hole according to the manual this is how they're identifying them here in the two different colors so they vary so this has got a green and a red I take it some of them have a blue and a red but we'll just mount those two LEDs there 
and tack them down to the board the same way. Next we'll install the buzzer. Polarity is not important on the buzzer. Now I noticed a major problem with the instruction manual is that they've got the color codes for the resistors printed incorrectly. So uh, we're going to find that out a little bit later on, but uh, I hope the values were correct, but the color codes for the values that they actually printed in the instruction manual are incorrect. So that may cause some people confusion. It certainly did for me for a bit until I looked at it and realized there was an error. Okay, now we're ready for the first test. So to test the microcontroller, we're going to plug in the power and we should hear a beep. This will tell us that the microcontroller is working. Okay, so that tells us that the microcontroller is working. Okay, now what's the next thing it says to do here? It says you should hear a beep after a few seconds, and then if I press and hold the reset button for a short while, it, it, it then reset it, it should, you should see the LED is marked L pulse. After it, stops, after it stops pulsing, the uh, it, you know, it will beep again. So I press and hold the switch, There we go, that means that it works. So now we're gonna build the boost converter. Now what the boost converter does is it steps up the five volts from the USB input to the 40 volts or so that's required by the uh, VFD uh, tubes. So we need to install a couple of resistors in here. We have, first of all, we have a, a 0.2 ohms, I believe it's this one here. And it's black, red, black, silver, gold. Note that this resistor was missing. Oh, where is it? I gotta find it here. And they actually gave me the wrong value for R6 in the kit. Well, there's no 0.2 ohm resistor here in in the, the pile of parts that came with this. And there's not a lot of parts. There is this uh, 45 ohm. What's my colors on this one here? Well, it looks to be yellow orange, black, my meter says 45. There's only one resistor of this size, R6. So I'm assuming either they gave me the wrong resistor or they've updated it and just haven't updated the instructions, but we'll mount this one in here. If need be, I'll have to go and change it, but it's the only resistor of that size that's in the package. So we'll mount that one in place of R6 keeping in mind that it might be the wrong value and I may have to change it. But. And of course it is the wrong value because this is going to affect the boost voltage. And I'm going to find when I do my voltage check that my voltage is going to be a bit low and I'm going to have to go to a lower value. I didn't have a 0.2 so I ended up going to a 1 ohm resistor, which works, but I think with the right value my display will be a little bit brighter once the project is completed. But we'll continue with what I have on hand which came with it. Then we have uh, R7, which is a 10K resistor. Brown, black, orange. There's a 10K right here. R7 is mounted right down here next to the MAX 1771. This board is of a really high quality. Beautiful plated board. Obviously a Japanese board being a Japanese kit from Japan. Got the really good quality Japanese board. Next is a 240K resistor, which is R6. That'll be a red, yellow, black, orange, brown. I believe it's this one here. Of course, if in if, if in question, just measure it. 
with meter. And it's measuring 240 ohms, which is exactly correct. This is R6. Um, R6 or R8? R R8. That last one didn't go in proper, did it? It must have slipped up because I uh, have this big buzzer mounted on it. I'm going to hear it from the credits out there that, yeah, that's why you don't mount the taller parts first. Yes, I know, I know. Proper kit building, you mount all the small parts first. But I'm doing this, as I say, because this is the order that they're asking me to put the parts in. Next is C1, which is a 10 microfarad electrolytic cap. It is polarized and the board is marked with a little minus sign for the negative. And C2 is the other capacitor, which is this one here. Again, the board is marked positive and negative. This one's going to lie flat like that. We're going to have the inductor next, which is this piece here. This is a 22 microhenry inductor. Inductor goes here. There are two ceramic caps to go down here. These go into uh, C3 and C4. These are not um, polarity sensitive. So C3 and C4, there's C3 right here. And C4 is right here. Next we'll mount the diode. goes down right there okay, next we'll mount the MOSFET we'll bend the leads down here and place the MOSFET into the board the MOSFET is going to be secure, secured down to the board so that the board can act as a heat sink for it I hope my camera's not acting up. I see the picture's flickering a bit on the viewfinder here. I want to check the file here when I'm done with soldering this down and make sure that my camera is not on its last legs. Next we uh, have to open up the caution static sensitive devices bag and retrieve the sockets for the ICs. So we have two sockets to go in, two 8 pin sockets. bend the pins over here to hold them in place. So now we're going to install the first IC here. This is the Max 1771, which is this one here. They are polarized. They only go in one direction and we've already inserted the IC socket. The pin number one is up here in the corner here. The notch and pin one is indicated here. This one goes into this socket. This is the driver for the uh, for the MOSFET for the boost converter. So pop that into the circuit. 
We should probably be ready for testing the boost converter now. So we need to use the multimeter this time. So we're going to test the voltage. So I'm going to turn the multimeter on, set it for DC voltage. And what I need to do is I need to mark the or measure the pin that's marked HV. We're going to put the black probe on the two pins marked ground, which is over here. And the five volts is tested to here, and the high voltage is tested over to here. So we're going to power the unit up. Now we'll get the meter in here, and we'll just test the voltages. So uh, ground. And we'll test the 5 volt supply. We have 5 volts. And the other one that we're testing is the one marked HV. And that is over here. HV to ground. And I have 19 volts, which is low. But you know what? That's probably because this resistor is the wrong value. They supplied me with the wrong value of resistor. So let's just uh, change that resistor out because that should be closer to 50 volts. Okay, now I've got the resistor changed to a 1 ohm resistor. Let's take a look and see if we get our, our 50 volts or 60 volts or whatever it's supposed to be. We'll see if our high voltage comes up now like it's supposed to. Okay, here's the meter. And we'll put the ground on the ground and the HV on the high voltage probe. And we're now at 38.4 volts, which is within the specified voltage because it says it's supposed to be between 35 and 50 volts. So we're getting 38 volts. Um, I'm still I'm running a 1 ohm resistor, so I'm going to be a little bit lower because it called for a 0.2, which I don't have, but I can always go back and change that. This should be enough to make the thing work. Um, okay, so we've got our 5 volt and 42 volt voltages. Well, close enough. Now we can put the rest of the components on the miscellaneous components. So we'll put the remaining resistors. There's two 4.7 uh, K ohm resistors. They'll be yellow, violet, orange, and they're R2 and R3. Of course, I'm reading off the screen. It says 2, point, 2 times 4.7 K ohm resistors, yellow, violet, orange. No, yellow, violet, red. 4700, 0, 0, 4700, not 47 K. The instructions are incorrect. This is uh, R2 and R3. So they go right down here. R2 and R3 is right here on the board. Not many parts to go on this board. There's actually not a lot in this. And it's one of the simpler kits to put together. Nothing like the old, like the Nixie tube, which you got tons of parts on them, right? And there's two 10K. And uh, they've got the they've got the colors wrong here as well. There's five 10K. Where are they? Um, where are the rest of them here? R1, 9, 10, 11, and 12. 10K is brown, black, orange. You know, I just realized something. This is a Jinglish manual. The Japanese to English translation on this is probably one of the worst I've seen. Um, I don't know whether I've got the right values and the right resistors now because the color codes they're calling out are not the color codes correct. Like, they'll say a... They'll say a, a 10k resistor and then they'll say brown black yellow well it's not it's brown black orange and the 1k resistors they called out as brown black orange so is it supposed to be a 1k or is it supposed to be a 10k well um that's a good question because now i now i'm kind of questioning this because this manual plus the fact that some of the parts that they've supplied me were incorrect I'm basically basing it on the, the count of the parts. I'm going to ignore what colors they say things are supposed to be on the manual because, well, every one of them so far has been wrong. I shouldn't say every one, but a lot of them have been wrong. So I'm back on track now with the right resistors here, I think. I hope. 
these ones are all the right ones. My voltages are right, so... But I think what's happened is when someone translated this, it's a Japanese kit, and when someone's translated the manual, they've translated it wrong. The two remaining capacitors, C5 and C6, looks like seven, there's nothing there. We're getting down to finishing this board. There's not many more parts left to go on here. And then it'll be to do the, uh, the display tubes, mount them to their board, mount the headers, and plug them in. Okay, I've got a 10 microfarad ceramic uh, cap here, and this is this one, and it's C7. I love it how they identify it, they say dark blue with short legs. A battery holder. It says first melt some solder on the terminal here. Looks like there's already some there, but we'll put some more on here. This is this is for the backup battery, so we just melt a little blob of solder there and then the the battery terminal goes in like this. There. So now that'll squeeze the battery in place to uh, maintain the time if the power is disconnected. Mount the switch for the alarm. Mount the other two tactile switches that are used to set the time. One thing I've noticed is that this is a this is a fully plated board, and it takes a fair bit of heat. It's like my solder doesn't even want to flow properly on this board unless I get it really hot. Next is this big IC socket. It's a, what they call a PLCC28 socket. This is inserted so that the square or shape matches out of the PC board. So there's one side that's got a flat outline. And so that's the way that the socket is going to go in like this now typically what I do is I'll, I'll bend over a couple pins here just to hold it in place for me to solder it so I'll bend one over on each side that'll hold it in place so that I can solder the rest of them in without having to worry about it falling through the board So next we'll install the EEPROM and the driver IC as they call it. And then we've got the, the HV5812. This is the high voltage driver IC. It only goes in one way. And you gotta be careful that you put it in the right way the first time because you need to specialized equipment to pop these things out once they've been placed but it is notched so we look down at the board here and pin one is our notched side over here here's our notch there See our notch on this side here, and that goes corresponds with the notch on this side of the IC. We just push it in place like that. That IC is now socketed. Now I can place the, the backup battery in here, and this board is pretty much done. I think that's all of the components now that we've mounted. 
This will back up the real-time clock once I install the battery. The battery slides in just like that. Okay, the uh, board is, this part of the board is done. All the components are mounted. And now it's time to uh, put the display board together. Got a couple headers, I guess, that have to go on here as well. I don't know which side they go on. Looks like the uh, the headers go on on this side and the pins go on the other side. So we'll mount our headers down here. Now the headers are a different size, so they're only going to go in one way. One goes here. The other one goes over here. So let's uh, flip the board over. Bend over the end pins just to hold it in place. Yeah, that will hold it and then I can solder it and that will complete this board. And there we have the completed board. And now it's time to uh, mount the display, mount the uh, tubes to the display board and get the project finished. Well, it's time to mount the tubes. The tubes all have wires that have to be separated and soldered down to this interface board. Now they only go in one way and there's going to be a space between two of the pins. So fan the wires out for each of the tubes one at a time. Um, there's, there's a, they say there's a gap between where there's no wire, but there actually is a shorter wire there on the gap. It just doesn't connect to anything internal inside the tube and the rest of them have got full length leads. So we're going to attach each of the tubes. I think probably the easiest way to solder this will be to create something that I can actually stand the thing up in while I'm working on it. Just rest it in a bit of tape here so that I can solder down each of the pins. We clip off the excess lead and move on to the next tube. Once again, our short pin that goes nowhere is in the dead space. So then the rest of them are all lined up correctly. Make sure that the tube is staying nice and flush. That's two tubes mounted. I'm going to mount the remaining four tubes and then we'll be back to finish this off. Okay, I've got the uh, tubes all mounted now. We have just the resistors. There's six resistors and the headers to go on. So the resistors mount through from the bottom of the board here. 
The job of the resistors is to provide a negative bias voltage to keep the tubes in cutoff state until they are called for by the multiplex circuit. Uh, by providing a negative voltage, it will repel the electrons being emitted from the cathode. Uh, when you want to illuminate a single tube, because of what it does is it strobes from, from one tube to the next, you reduce that negative bias to that specific grid, which will then attract more electrons towards the plate and uh, the, ca the anodes and light up the segments that are raised to their positive potential to light up those segments. You have to count all the pins out and uh, bend them all over and then try and solder them down into these little grooves. I guess compared to feeding them through holes like the, uh, the uh, other one that I built that used tubes of a similar type design that would be the the uh, pneumatron. You put all the the, the uh, pins through holes and pulled them tight and then soldered them in. They were a little easier to solder in once they were actually mounted to the board itself. Anyway, those are the resistors. Let's uh, tack down the resistors and complete the rest of the unit. So now I'm going to just solder down these. There's actually two pins that don't line up with anything on the front here, which is a little different. But um, the rest of them all line up here, so we're going to solder these down and hopefully it's going to work. I'll take one to make sure this Chinese solder that I've got here, this stuff is not as good as the last batch. The last batch I bought was really good and I bought the same brand and this stuff just does not flow as nice as the other. I think it's a little thicker and it's just not as good as the last one. The other, one, the other stuff was 0.8 millimeter and this time I got one millimeter and I don't like it. But I'm going to be stuck with it for a while because it's a big roll. Okay, that should complete the project. We'll plug our adapter in now and hope for the best. Is it going to light up? Or is it not? It's lighting up. And we're just checking all the segments to make sure that they all light up. Looks like they do. Now we gotta set it, figure out how to set this thing. Let's set the date on this thing if I can figure this out. Okay, I press the set button. It says 1201. I haven't set the set it yet. And uh, okay, it says 120205. It's what time it thinks it is. Uh, how do I set this? I go click 24-hour mode. Uh, auto date. Alarm, brightness, date, uh, year, 14, 15, 16, 17, month, December, right, yeah, so 12, day, it's the 24th. Then the daylight saving time is on or off. Uh, right now we're not in daylight saving time, so it's the time. That's, uh, and then the, what is this? Going to display the date for me. Okay, got to get through here and find the hours. Brightness, date. GPS, no. Uh, temperature, time, yes. Hour. Twenty three hours and thirty eight minutes. There's minute. Set this to 38. It's almost Christmas Day here. It's Christmas Eve. And then volume, that's for the buzzer. 
and there we go 11 38 and six seconds you can see the time counting not very bright I figured it would be brighter than this but it's pretty bright in here I think when I kill the lights it's gonna look a lot better so there it is it's uh, working you can see the time on here nice and easy to read again it's still pretty bright in here I haven't turned out the light yet uh, that's it uh, the link to where I got this kit, I bought it off Tindy.com. I think if I change that resistor to the 0.2 ohm that was that it was uh, listed as requiring, because again the kit came with the wrong size resistor. I've got a 1 ohm in there now. It calls for a 0.2. That's I think resulting in my high voltage being a little bit low, which of course is going to affect the brightness of the display. But there it is. It's working, and uh, I am stoked. I want to make it brighter, but it looks pretty good. If you want to support my channel, you can do it two ways. You can either do it through PayPal or you can do it through uh, Patreon. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.